the recommendations of these candidates that you present to me this morning have prepared well and are ready to receive this sacrament. I happily accede your request to confirm them in the ceremony this morning. Thanks be to God. I'd like to address the candidates for a few moments, so could you please be seated. I want to talk to you about this very wonderful sacrament that you'll receive this morning. And I think really the best way to understand the meaning of the sacrament of confirmation is to understand what happened to the apostles at Pentecost. So we heard the reading from the Acts of the Apostles about Pentecost. So I'm sure you've learned about Pentecost, haven't you, in your preparation for today. So I want to talk about what happened at Pentecost. But I think to understand what happened at Pentecost is good just to go back before that. As you know, after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples on a number of occasions. On the very last time, he told them to meet him on a hillside outside Jerusalem. And there he gave them two very important instructions. He said to them, go out to all the world, proclaim the gospel to all creatures, baptise them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe all I've commanded you. In other words, Jesus was saying, look, my time is now finished. I must ascend to my Father. But you, my disciples, must continue my mission. Must take the very ends of the earth, even as far as Tasmania. He said another thing. He said, but first, go back to Jerusalem and wait. Wait till you are clothed with power from on high. So that's why after the ascension, the disciples went back to Jerusalem, went back to the same room where they'd been with Jesus at the Last Supper, and there they waited. Then on Pentecost Day, the words of Jesus were fulfilled and the power of the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles. I always think it's very interesting that Jesus would say two things. He said, go out, but wait. You know, why did Jesus ask them to wait? You would have thought, they've been with Jesus for about three years. They said all the extraordinary things he said and done. They'd been in the crowd spellbound as Jesus was speaking to them. They'd seen the miracles that Jesus had worked. They realised that Jesus was the Messiah, the one the Jewish people had been waiting for for centuries. Not only that, they had witnessed Jesus risen from the dead. So they thought, well, surely these disciples know the message to give to the world. And, and they did. But Jesus knew they lacked something. What they lacked was the courage and confidence to do it. See, we're told by St John, they used to lock the door of the room where they were gathered for fear of the Jews. See, they were frightened. They were frightened, the same thing might happen to them, happened to Jesus. And Jesus knew that unless they could overcome this fear, they wouldn't be able to carry out his mission. That's why he told them to wait till they were clothed with power from on high. And then when the Holy Spirit came up, down upon them, they were wonderfully changed. And immediately, as we heard today, St Peter goes up, he opens up the door of the room where they were, and a large crowd had gathered outside, and he said to them, people of Jerusalem, I want to tell you about this Jesus of Nazareth whom you've crucified. He has risen from the dead. He's Lord and Christ. They proclaimed the message of the gospel. Now, we're a lot like the disciples, aren't we? I mean, you believe in Jesus, don't you? you? You've read stories of Jesus' teaching, really being inspired by what he had to teach. You've, you've read about, he, about his resurrection. You believe he rose from the dead. You believe all the same things that the disciples believed. But is it also true? It's not always easy for us to live out what we believe. I mean, you're with your mates. You know, they start giving you a hard time about being a Catholic. If you're not a Catholic, are you? You don't go to Mass. That's boring. We can get embarrassed, can't we? Rather than stand up and say, yeah, I'm a Catholic. I'm proud to be a Catholic. Yeah, I go to Mass. That's what Jesus asked us to do. You know, you're with your friends. Say, let's go and do this. But you know, it's wrong. You say, you shouldn't do it. But you feel... I've got to go along with them. So you go along and afterwards you feel guilty rather than saying, look, we shouldn't do that. That's not right. You know, we know what we believe. 
we know how we should live. But we too can lack the courage and confidence to live out what we believe. That's why we need the Holy Spirit in our life, in the same way the Holy Spirit came in the life of the Apostles of Pentecost. Am I making some sense so far? Yep? Okay, good, good. Let's keep going. Let's talk about Pentecost. You read the story? We heard it again today, didn't we? Just before the Holy Spirit came, there was a sound that filled the room where they were. What was the sound? What was happening? Who can tell me? What was happening? The wind, that's right, the wind was blowing. Can you see the wind? You can't see the wind, can you? The wind's invisible. How do you know the wind is real or the wind's invisible? Like if I look out a window and say, oh, it's a windy day today, how would you know it's a windy day if the wind's invisible? How would you know? You could feel it? Yeah, what would you see? Yeah, the leaves would be blowing and trees would be blowing and so on. So you can't see the wind. But you know the wind is real by the effects that the wind has. Will you see the Holy Spirit today? Do you think so? Maybe, maybe not. I don't think you will because the Holy Spirit's a spirit, isn't he? The Holy Spirit's invisible. You can't see the Holy Spirit. But you'll know the Holy Spirit is real by the effects that the Holy Spirit has. Just like the Holy Spirit had an enormous effect upon the apostles at Pentecost, so the Holy Spirit has real effects in our lives. Just like we saw the effect on the apostles, the Holy Spirit wants to give us gifts. Did you learn about the gifts of the Spirit? Did you learn about the gifts? How many are there? Seven. Do you know them? Can you name one? Wisdom. Okay, what's another one? Courage, two. Wonder and awe, three. Understanding, four. Knowledge, five. Did you find them anywhere? <laughs> Sorry? Piety, six. What are we missing? One. What's the last one? Understanding, isn't it? I think understanding? Yeah. So seven out of seven. Good. These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're interesting gifts like wisdom, knowledge, understanding. They're gifts of the mind. See, it's the way the Holy Spirit moves in our minds. So Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. See, one thing the Holy Spirit does, he guides our minds towards the truth. So when you make an important decision, ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten you. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. You make the right decision. Because the Holy Spirit said to enlighten our minds. Okay? So, in a few moments, you'll come up the front here. And then we'll, we'll, we're going to have a very special moment in which we will pray for you, praying that God will give you these gifts of the Holy Spirit. So Father Bernard and, and Father Stephen are going to come with me. We'll lay our hands on you, calling down the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Very special moment in the ceremony. Okay, the wind was blowing. Something else happened. Another sign of the Spirit came to each of the disciples individually. What was that? What was that? Fire, that's right. There were tongues of fire, weren't there? I said to the disciples. Well, I think that's very interesting. See, remember I said that they were in this upper room, they were frightened, they were frightened. So God's looking down on them and saying, I want to light a fire in their hearts. I don't want them to be weak and wishy-washy. I want them to be strong and confident. You know, when somebody's on fire, you know, if somebody's playing football, playing a sport, and they're playing really well, we say, they're on fire. They're not burning up, are they? No. What, what's happening? They're strong, they're confident, they know what they're doing. That's how God wants us to be as Christians, not weak and wishy-washy. Strong and confident, knowing what we believe, knowing how we should live, standing up for what we know to be right and true and good. So God wants us to have a fire in our hearts, the same way the Holy Spirit gave a fire in the hearts of the apostles. Did you all choose a saint for confirmation? Yeah? Who, who did you choose? That Teresa, she's a wonderful lady, isn't she? Teresa of Calcutta. She cared for the poor and those who were dying on the streets. She took them in and looked after them. That's a wonderful example, isn't it? She's a great saint. Who did you choose? You, you also chose St. Teresa of Calcutta. You chose? Mary McKillop. Mary McKillop, our own saint. Very good. Who did you choose? I Fran- oh, did you. St. Jose Maria Escriva, who particularly founded the Open State Movement. Very good. Saints, saints are great people. 
Saints did great things. See, because they let the Holy Spirit inspire them to do great things. You know we're all called to be saints. You can't get to heaven unless you're a saint. We're all called to be saints. We want the Holy Spirit to inspire us. We want the Holy Spirit to be a, a fire in our hearts to inspire us in living the Christian life. And so today, I'll be sitting up there in my seat and each of you will come up to me individually. I'll take the chrism oil, I'll anoint you on the forehead and I'll say, be sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm saying, Lord, seal in the hearts of each of these candidates the fire of the Holy Spirit. Not just today, but always that the Holy Spirit will inspire you in the living of the Christian life. All right? Am I still making sense? Excellent. Very good. Very good. So just before we have the, the rite of confirmation, I'm going to ask you to renew the vows of your baptism. Okay? So the first question I'm going to ask you is, do you reject Satan and all his works and all his empty promises? What are you going to say? You're going to say, I do, yeah, I reject what's bad, what's dark, what's wrong, what's evil. I choose the good. I choose to lead a good life. It's very basic, but very important decision. Then I say to you, do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? And what are you going to say? I do, I do believe that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth and he hasn't done a wonderful job in Tasmania, this beautiful place in which we live. But do you know the most important thing he's created? Us. We're the high point of his creation. Like 25 years ago, you didn't exist, did you? No. God gave you life. And when God created you, he gave you a soul and lived forever. You are going to live forever. And God wants you to live forever with him in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? And then I say to you, and do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, born of the Virgin Mary, crucified, died and rose again? And you're going to say, I do. You see, when you say, I do, you say, I believe, I'm, I believe in Jesus Christ. See, that's what makes you a Christian. And you say, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow his teaching, his example, because I know that he is the way and the truth and the life. That's what makes us a Christian, following Jesus Christ. And then finally, I'm going to say to you, I'm going to say to you, and do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? And you're going to say, I do. You say, I believe in the church. See, Jesus established the church. He knew we could not survive as Christians alone. We need one another. We need the community of faith. That's why we have a parish, like the Cathedral Parish here. You know the most important thing a parish does? What we're doing today gathering together to celebrate the Mass for one very simple reason. At the Last Supper, Jesus said, do this in memory of me. And that's why from the very beginning the Christians gathered together for Mass, doing the same thing that Jesus did at the Last Supper. So be part of the Christian community. Go to Mass and then shortly you'll come to a Mass here at the Cathedral and you come up and receive Holy Communion for the first time. Fully involved now in the life of the church. So today when you receive the Holy Spirit, say, I'm going to live as a Christian. I'm going to be part of the life of the parish. I want to go to Mass. I want to receive our Lord in my heart in Holy Communion. Okay? Probably enough for me, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I agree. Let's go ahead with the confirmation ceremony. So can I ask the candidates if you please stand?